now I shall shift here to well, a new new section, uh, physiotype interferometry, and uh, well, major contributors here yeah, to this here yeah, are of course Young, but also well, Fizo, Stefan, Michelson, Pease, and uh, here is just a reminder about uh, the double slit yeah, Young experiment here. Yeah. So, here I have uh, represented a screen, yeah, with two holes in the screen. And then uh, the plane wave, monochromatic at wavelength lambda, present, represented here in orange, falling on the screen, yeah? So it comes from a very distant light source. Now the separation between the two holes, yeah, is B. And if I adopt yeah, a system of coordinates yeah, x, z, and y, yeah, perpendicular to the screen, where the positions of these two holes yeah, can be represented as uh, b divided by 2, then 0, 0, of course. Now, minus b divided by 2 and 0, 0. So 0, 0, x equals 0, z equals 0, y equals 0 is there. And now, if I look yeah, in a distant screen, yeah, what happens, what is the distribution of light? Yeah? But this is mon monochromatic light yeah, at the wavelength lambda. Well, it's very easy. I know that whenever the difference in the distance of the two beams yeah, coming from the two holes is equal to an integer number of wavelengths, there will be constructive interference. And whenever it will be an odd number yeah, of half of wavelengths, it will be the destruction, yeah. So, what we should do, yeah, we should estimate this quantity, yeah. What is the difference between the module of PP1 minus module of PP2? Yeah, I will do that on the blackboard. Well, because it's very instructive, you know. So let's estimate the value of this expression. And after we'll say, okay, this should be equal to an integer number of times the wavelengths. So how to proceed? Yeah? So PP1. So I could say, okay, let's estimate PP high, where high is equal to 1 or to 2. Yeah? So this, this is equal to square root of so P is coordinate x, y, z. So it will be x minus. So it will be, uh, let's take uh, the first one, P half square plus y minus 0 square plus z minus 0 square. Correct? So this is PP1. So we can say here that, well, it is equal to yep. This is equal to what? So I will just put z in front of the square root. I will say, OK, this is equal to z multiplied by 1 plus x minus b over 2 square plus y square divided by z square. Correct? Now I shall make use yeah, of uh, the Taylor development of this quantity. Square root of 1 plus epsilon. So to first order, you do you agree that it is 1 plus epsilon over 2 plus etc. etc. Yeah? So I don't make the development of that yet, yeah, but so here I could say okay, this will be equal to what? To z multiplied by 1 plus x minus b over 2 square plus y square divided by 2z square. 2z square. Yeah. Now, pp2, model pp2, well, it will be exactly, it will be something very similar. z 
1 plus, well, here it will be x plus, yeah? b over 2 square plus y square divided by 2z square. Yes? Very simple, huh? And now if I make the difference, so pp1 module pp1 minus module pp2, so I just make the subtraction of the two. And you see there are many quantities which will go away, yeah? So uh, first, yeah, the z, yeah, I can put it z here. Here it would be 2 over z, and here it would be z, and here 2 over z. Now, this quantity will go away, the same. The x square will go away. The b divided by 2 square will go away. What will remain is just a double product. Yeah? So what will remain is just what? It will be x times b over 2, well, times 2, then divided by 2z. And uh, 1 will come from here, 1 will come from there. So in principle, I should put here a 4, correct? Because I have the double product from here and the double product from there, yeah? So factor 4. So this is equal, finally, to x times b over z. And now this should be equal to an integer number of times the wavelengths. So let's take, well, for n equals 0, it's trivial. n equals 0 yeah, will correspond to this maximum of interference. Now for n equal 1, yeah, I will move yeah, to the secondary maximum. So let's take n equal 1. So for n equal 1, we have x times b over z equal lambda, or x over z equal lambda over b. Yeah? Now, wh what does represent x over z? Yeah? Well, you see, x is a distance yeah, between two maxima. Yeah? This is x. And divided by z, the distance yeah, between the vocal plane yeah, and the center yeah, of, the, of, the, of the screen. So it is an angle. Yeah? It is the angular separation between two maxima. So this is angular, well, this is the power, well, the resolution power of my interferometer, yeah? Phi is equal to lambda over b. Okay, so here is what we've done. Yeah, so phi is equal x over z, and for n equal one, it's lambda over b. So I see that well, this gives you a resolving power, of course, yeah? And uh, smaller is the wavelength, yeah? Well, closer will be uh, yeah, the, the maxima, or larger is the distance between the two holes, yeah? And still closer will be the distance between uh, two consecutive maxima. Okay, now, well, FISO, yeah, had a very bright idea, yeah? And uh, this will be explained on this transparency. Yeah? So he used an 80 centimeter telescope yeah, of Marseille. So you see, this, is, this represents the objective of your telescope. It can be a lens or it can be a mirror. It doesn't make any difference. And on top of this uh, objective yeah, is a screen with two holes. Well, maybe one thing I forgot to mention yeah, from my previous demonstration here is that I see that the y quantity has disappeared, yeah? The y quantity, yeah? So I have x, I have z, but there is no y. And the reason is that uh, when I made this demonstration, if it doesn't depend on y, it means that it's true for every y value, yeah? And the reason is that I come here, 
what I represented in this plane yeah, is true for all the planes yeah, uh, which are perpendicular to the y direction. So what I should see yeah, in this screen here are just interference fringes. Yeah, so are fringes, in fact. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's true for any value of, of y. OK, now let's go back to these graphs. Yeah? So you have two holes. Now, if I would ask you, yeah, well, I just block one hole here, yeah? And well, typically, this could be uh, 15 centimeter in diameter, yeah? Well, I just block one hole. And if I ask you, what do you see in the focal plane if I would block the light passing through, through the second hole? What would you see? So I block one hole with my hand, and I look in the focal plane yeah, of my Telescope. Yeah, what what would I see? Airy disk. I would say an airy disk, which angular diameter is given by what? Lambda over d, where d is what? The size of the hole. You agree. Now, if instead yeah, I block this hole, let this one open, what would I see? I would see exactly the same. Yeah? So you see the Two heavy disks yeah, will reinforce the lights, yeah? but in addition, there would be interference. So I would see, of course, yeah, interference fringes, which are perpendicular, yeah, you see, they are perpendicular to the direction between the two holes, yeah? just as in the, well, uh, well uh, in the Previous experiments, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. Now, well, Fizeau yeah, came with uh, the following proposition. He said, well, let's assume that we observe a double star, yeah? So there are two sources of light which are incoherent, yeah? They are incoherent between each other, yeah? Would you agree that one star would give you these interference fringes? Second star would give these interference fringes, yeah? So if the stars are very well separated, yeah? Then you see two airy disks like this, yeah, very well separated. Now let's assume that the two stars yeah, are very near to each other, very near, so near that their angular separation is zero. So of course you would still see this, yeah, okay. Now let's assume that I separate the star from a very small angular distance, such that the maxima of one comes into the minima of the second one. What would happen, yeah, is that the fringes would disappear, yeah, you see? And so, well, Fizeau just proposed that the fringes would disappear, yeah, for an angular shift delta, which is just phi divided by two, because we know that phi is angular distance between two uh, maxima interferences, yeah? so. If the angular separation is half that value, yeah, there, are, there is disappearance of the fringes, yeah. And so, well, this was the intuitive idea of Fizeau, yeah, to look at all the stars in the sky, with the hope that maybe because a star can be assimilated, yeah, to a very large number of incoherent source of light, so that if you would resolve it, yeah, the fringes would have the contrast equal to zero, there would be a smearing yeah, of the fringes. Yeah? So this was this idea. So whenever the angular diameter or angular separation between several stars yeah, exceeds yeah, half of the value of the angular resolution of your instrument, yeah, you would see a smearing of the fringes. Yeah? Like that, you see very well the fringes. It's not resolved, not resolved. And then, oops, it starts being resolved. And then the contrast yeah, of the fringes disappear, de decreases. Yeah. OK. Now, well, a quantity yeah, that objectively measures yeah, the contrast of the fringes yeah, is called the visibility. And what is the visibility? Yeah, is the following quantity. It's the maximal intensity of the fringes, so this one minus the minimum intensity of that fringe, which is darker, divided by the sum of the two. Okay, now if 
let's assume we are in that case where I cannot resolve a star. Yeah? What is the visibility? How much? So I max is I max. What is I mean? So visibility varies between zero and one. Yeah. So remember that for one, you don't resolve the star. For zero, you fully resolve the star. Okay. And so, well, in uh, 1873, Stefan makes use yeah, of the 80 centimeter telescope of Marseille Observatory. And well, he sets yeah, on top yeah, a screen uh, with, in fact, two slits. And uh, we will have the, tool, the tools later to show that, well, the shape of the, of the slits yeah, is not very important. Well, as long as they are similar, yeah, the two. The two states are similar. And they look at all the stars with the hope of resolving them. Yeah? And they cannot resolve anyone. Yeah? They don't see any change in the contrast of the fringes after looking at hundreds of stars. Yeah? So they are very disappointed. Yeah? Now, the separation between the two slits yeah, is about 65 centimeters, 65 centimeter, which corresponds to a resolving power of 0 0.16 second of hour. 0 0.16 second of arc, yeah? So they know that all the stars have an angular diameter smaller than, well, 160 mini arc second, okay? Yeah. Remember that Newton already estimated, yeah, to 3 mini arc second, yeah, the size of the stars, yeah? So no surprise, yeah. Okay, now, well, what happened next, yeah, is that uh, Michelson, yeah, had the bright idea in Berkeley yeah, to use a 30 centimeter telescope to observe the Galilean satellites, so the four satellites of Jupiter. And uh, with a size of 30 centimeter, you would find that the resulting power of your telescope yeah, is about half a second of arc. Yeah? And he looked yeah, at the Galilean satellites and he could resolve them. Yeah? So he could, for some of them, see the disappearance of the fringes. Yeah? And then he compared yeah, uh, the angular diameters with uh, those values derived using other methods, yeah, classical methods. Yeah? And it was perfect, in perfect agreement. Yeah? And well, it, it's a kind of a pity that uh, neither Fizeau, neither Stefan yeah, thought about doing such an experiment also yeah, with using Galilean satellites. Yeah? So it was Michelson who did that. Yeah? And then Michelson w wanted absolutely yeah, to resolve stars. And uh, well, his idea, so well, this is an 80 centimeter telescope of Marseille used by Fizeau and Stefan. So let's make 10 minute breaks. And later on, we shall just uh, continue a little bit. Yeah? And uh, I will tell you uh, how Michelson and Pease yeah, proceeded yeah, to resolve the first stars. Yeah? Before going to the, this laboratory experiments that we'll do in about maybe 15 minutes. I will just show you yeah, how Michelson yeah, proceeded to measure the first angular diameters. Yeah? So he used uh, the 100-inch Hooker telescope here yeah, on Mount Wilson that you see here. And with Pease, yeah, they just put a beam seven meter long yeah, on top of the telescope. And you may, you may see, yeah, well, four little mirrors here, so two inclined at 45 degrees in that direction, two others inclined yeah, in uh, the opposite direction yeah, by 45 degrees too. So now you see that the light yeah, coming from a distant star yeah, falls on this mirror, goes here, is reflected yeah, by the main mirror and focus yeah, there. Now the ori originality, yeah, well, you can see the, the four mirrors here too, yeah? And the originality yeah, of uh, this construction was that the two external mirrors yeah, could be moved yeah, apart, yeah? So changing the baseline yeah, at will. And now, well, they knew yeah, from Eddington yeah, that uh, Alpha Orionis, Betelgeuse, yeah, was a supergiant star, right, supergiant with a diameter, well, about 400 times that of the sun. And in spite of its very big distance, 
650 light years away from us, yeah? They look at it with this seven beam, uh, seven uh, meter beam, interferometer, and they could resolve it, yeah? It means that they, they saw the smearing of the fringes. It means contrast of the fringes going to zero, yeah? By just changing the baseline. And uh, when well, the angular distance, uh, the angular diameter they derived was 47 milli arc second. 47 milli arc second, yeah. Of course, this is more than uh, Newton's prediction of 3 milli arc second, but the reason is that this is a red supergiant, yeah. So, no surprise. So, you see here the image that they saw, yeah, with the high piece. Now, to to be able yeah, to achieve uh, such a measurement, yeah, they have to make sure that the difference in the distance yeah, between the two beams yeah, coming well, along this direction and that direction from the star yeah, down to the focal plane yeah, differs by less than typically a few microns. Yeah? So it means that the beam had to be very robust, very stable, no vibration, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So the requested accuracy was over several microns. OK. Now maybe well, what I would just add is that Anderson, yeah, one of their collaborators, used the same experiment yeah, to resolve many spectroscopic binaries. Well, Michael, Michael, Michelson and Pease themselves yeah, could resolve five diameters of stars. Yeah? So there were four more stars that they've been able to, to resolve. After that, yeah, they tried to put a beam of 15 meter long so that they could have reached an angular resolution of about 10 milli arc second. Yeah? But because of the technology available at that time, yeah, vibration, flexures, etc. Yeah, they could not succeed. They tried during a few years, yeah? but um, the maximum baseline was seven meters. So because of all those difficulties, yeah, well, physotype interferometry yeah, was abandoned. Yeah? And well, I didn't mention, but those measurements were made in 1920, yeah? during the winter of 1920. So it was abandoned and um, then came well around the years 50s, yeah, another type of inter interferometry known as intensity interferometry, yeah, by uh, Brown and Twist. And uh, this is based on, on a totally different principle. It's based on uh, measuring the coherence of the light, yeah, uh, collected by two independent telescopes, yeah. It's a totally different uh, approach. Then also, well, uh, Antoine Labéry, who is a French astronomer, yeah, used what you have heard about speckle interferometry, which is still another technique. And then it was in 1975, the same Antoine Labéry, with a French professor, yeah, who succeeded yeah, in uh, using two independent telescopes, so not anymore a beam yeah, on top of a telescope, but two independent telescopes. I think the size was 20, 70, uh, 27 centimeters and separated by up to 144 meters, yeah? And they could resolve uh, the Vega star in the sky, yeah? But this was in 1975. So from 1920 until 1975, yeah, nothing happened, yeah, in optical interferometry. But as you know, in radio astronomy, yeah, well, interferometry was used because uh, where the constraints are much less severe. The constraint I mentioned for optical light yeah, of uh, an accuracy between the two paths of lights yeah, being the same within a few microns yeah, can be relaxed yeah, at the radio wavelengths because the wavelength of radio yeah, is much, much larger. Yeah. So now, wha now wha what I would propose yeah, is um, to make some experiment with you. So first experiment, yeah, uh, you will receive yeah, a piece of cartoon, then uh, some aluminum, oops, a little sheet of aluminum, then a needle, a needle, yeah. And well, what you try to do, yeah, is to make right near the center a hole. Yeah, 
So just try to, <clears throat> to make a hole uh, very perpendicular yeah, to the sheet with a size of about maybe half a millimeter in a diameter. Yeah. It's OK? Easy? <laughs> well, if you, I think the first holes yeah, will, be, will be bad, yeah, but you can make different holes elsewhere. Then when, when you, you find that you have a good hole, you take this piece of cartoon, yeah? You put the hole, yeah? The small holes just around the center of the big holes. Then uh, we will give you some glue, and you may glue the piece of aluminum. Then I will put here, yeah, two lights, which the well, angular radius yeah, is very small. And uh, you should be able with uh, this uh, single hole experiment yeah, in the aluminum, yeah, look yeah, for your eye, and you should see the hairy disk. Yeah? Well, smaller will be the hole, bigger will be the hairy disk. Yeah? And, but fainter it will also be. Yeah? So there is a compromise. So, well, typically a hole with a diameter of a half a millimeter yeah, is a good, a good size. Yeah? So you have to try several times. So I will circulate it. Yeah. After there will be the second experiment. Yeah. Then you take a second sheet of uh, aluminium, and now you try to make two holes separated by, if possible, yeah, one millimeter, and with the uh, angular size, so each hole of half a millimeter. <laughs> so. As I say, yeah, probably the, the first pairs of holes you will make yeah, won't be good, but then you can make other ones. Yeah. We have plenty of aluminum paper. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> what you should see look, while looking at a distant source of light, you see the airy disk, but crossed by the interference fringes. Yeah. And then later, after my lecture, yeah, what you could do is the following. Yeah, is, uh, well, I would set a source of light here. And if you go far away, far, far, far away enough yeah, with your interferometer, you will see the fringes. And now, if you approach, when you will closer, the contrast of the fringes should decrease. And eventually, at a certain distance, you, you will see the smearing of the fringes, so no fringes anymore. Now you know that if you divide lambda by the distance between your two holes, maybe one millimeter, you find what is the angular size of the source of light. Now, if you know the distance, you may derive what is the linear diameter of the source of light. So uh, it, it's very nice because you can do that experiment at home and, and play with the variation of the distance between you and the source of light, or have several interferometers with uh, different baselines and see the different type of uh, fringes that that you may observe, yeah. So you see on uh, on your cartoon, yeah. The idea is that you set, yeah, the one hole experiment above the two holes experiment below. Then you have uh, the two into one, yeah. And uh, this is a very interesting one. So you see that the fringes, yeah, are perpendicular, yeah, to the distance between the two holes. So you see here, the two holes are almost touching each other. Yeah? So the base is a half a millimeter in size, separated by half a millimeter. This would be perfect. Not easy to, to, to do. And now, well, what's amazing, I have a question to you. Everything what I've told until now was for monochromatic light. Yeah? But this is not monochromatic light. Yeah, it's white light. Why does it work? Yeah. In fact, yeah, you agree, the spacing yeah, between the angular, the angular diameter between two maxima yeah, is a lambda over d. Yeah? OK, the first extremum will be for n equals 0. Yeah? So this, is, this will be a maximum of white light. Now, for n equals 1, the spacing is lambda over d. So if whether you take uh, 500,000 or 600,000, it doesn't make a big difference, yeah? Yeah? So, well, if we would have good, very good high, we could see a chromatic dispersion, 
So we could see that blue light is less separated than red light, yeah? But our vision doesn't allow us to see that, yeah? Therefore, we see, well, fringes in white light, yeah? Yeah. So now, well, because it's mid midday, yeah, I think it's a good time, yeah, anyway, to break. But if you have still, if you still have some time, what you can try, if you have a good interferometer, is to try to get closer to the light source and see whether you see a change in the contrast in the visibility of the fringes, yeah? So if you are very far away, the visibility should be one. If you get very close, the visibility should go down to zero, yeah? And in between, you should see changes in visibility. So it's a very nice, uh, simple experiment, yeah? To visualize yeah, what interferometry is about, yeah? So next time, what we will do, well, I will address the problem of the coherence of light, yeah? Exactly the fact that astronomers don't work with white light. They don't work with monochromatic light because if you work in, with monochromatic light, it means that the band pass yeah, is so narrow that uh, you don't get any photons, yeah? But they work yeah, with a narrow band, yeah? And then we produce what is known as quasi-monochromatic light. So it's not monochromatic, but quasi, quasi-monochromatic. And so well, these are the different sections that we'll see um, next time, yeah? With a very important theorems, yeah? And then uh, some very nice results, yeah? So it will be a, a little bit more theoretical, yeah, next time. <laughs>